But I want to pass it to Imam Mendes, and I know he's going to take us through uh, one of these, uh, this beautiful, beautiful collection of hadith. So we look forward to this, uh, the hadith of this week. But I also wanted to ask you, Sidi Imam Mendes, if you had any reflections, um, you know, for the prophetic biography and what it means for us as far as the time that we're in now where there is a lot of dissension and there's a lot of separation ar around people, whether it comes to, whether it's race, whether it's class, whether it's even I ideologies across the political spectrum, uh, nation nationalities clashing and um, things of this nature. And I wonder if you might reflect, and I, I kind of jokingly mentioned to you beforehand that the, those of us that grew up watching the message, we might have this idea that it was pretty monocultural. Maybe Bilal, Sayyidina Bilal was the one exception, but in fact, that gives a really skewed picture of the sense of the actual milieu, if you will, of what the Prophet was, was uh, how his mission manifested, that he was actually in contact with the, the great empires of the day, from the Roman Empire to the Persian to the Abyssinian, but also with peoples from a wide range of tribes and a wide range of backgrounds and languages. I wonder if you might speak about that miracle of how he brought all of these people together and reminded them what really is the measure of a human being um, before you um, bless us with a commentary on the hadith of the day, inshallah. So we welcome all of you and we welcome you, Imam Mendes. The floor is yours. Assalamu alaikum alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Peace be upon you all and the loving compassion of God and his blessings. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. We seek the help and the assistance of the all-encompassing name of God, the most loving the eternally compassionate Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa ikhwanihi min al-Nabi wa mursaleen We ask that Allah bless and grant peace to our leader Muhammad and his family and his companions and his brother, his brethren from amongst the prophets and the messengers I thank you my dear brother, my teacher Baraka Blue, Ahmed James, and Assalamu Alaikum to all of you. Uh, those of you who are joining us from Egypt and New Jersey and uh, different parts of the globe. Uh, yes, I, I think this is one of the khasa'is, the distinguishing traits of our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that his, his community, that the companions around him were from diverse cultures, diverse uh, linguistic groups, and even among the Arabs, right, from diverse tribes and clans. And it, it's, it's really one of the miracles that Allah, that God manifested through him, that he was able to be this unifying force and, and we see this at the Hajj, right? We see this when you go to Hajj or Umrah, um, and we hope it stays that way. Uh, but to, bring, to be this unifying force, bringing together uh, peoples that were otherwise dispersed. And I think, when uh, sadly, when we go to too many mosques, when we go to too many masajid, uh, we don't see that diversity. We don't see that uh, variety, and we know from studying ecosystems and biology that the more diverse, the more rich an ecosystem is, the more resilient it is, the more uh, able it is to withstand invasion and disease. So it's to our benefit. It's to our benefit to, to include uh, as many cultures, even American culture, that's within the Quran and Sunnah, even European culture, that's within the Quran and Sunnah, uh, in our mosques, in our Islamic centers, in our schools, uh, because that 
invigorates and it revives the, the spirit for, of, of Islam, of Iman, of Ihsan, uh, for a new generation. So I really hope that those of you that are within uh, driving distance, like Baraka Blue said, of, uh, of uh, Wasat, I hope you're able to attend. And if you're not, I hope you can establish in your locales spaces that are not designed and i've you know i've served in mosques you know i've served in mosques and i've, I've worked at islamic schools you know some of these institutions are designed to only include and, and make one culture or two cultures feel welcome you know it's not something that just happens it's by design and, and we need to stop this cycle if, if we want to survive, if we want to stay relevant, and if we want Allah to love us, if we want Allah to be pleased with us. So, and if we want, and if we want to truly follow uh, this, this beautiful sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad, this beautiful path of inclusion of uh, different cultures. And uh, so, alhamdulillah, yeah, thank you for that. May Allah bless wasat and, and continue to. Uh, continue to inspire you to do these incredible events and programs and may they be transformative. And speaking of transformation, we are going to be talking about the transformative power of charity and good speech today the transformative power of charity and good speech. <coughs> and when you hear the word charity, when you hear the word charity, think of charity in its most comprehensive, universal meaning. When you hear the word good speech, as we'll be learning from Sheikh Saleh Jafari, May Allah Ta'ala, may God be pleased with him uh, from his commentary. When, we, when you think of good speech, think of good speech in its most comprehensive and, and universal implications. And what I love about this particular lesson today, it's Hadith 23, for those of you who have this incredible book by Sheikh Saleh Al Jafari, Reassurance of the Seeker, translated by Ustad. Sama Dajani, may Allah preserve him, on page 163. Uh, you know, what I, what, I, what I love about uh, this hadith is how it makes spirituality practical and accessible to everybody. Whether you are uh, a scholar or a preacher or a religious leader or not, whether you are wealthy or someone of modest means, uh, you know, whether you are old or young, whether you are, you are abled, able-bodied, or whether you are disabled, it makes the spirit, spiritual progress, it makes the path to salvation and wilaya and allyship friendship with God within reach for all of us. And so with that, let us begin. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. As always, we'll begin with reading the hadith. <clears throat> and from there, we will go into uh, the uh, Mashallah. We'll go into the translation. Uh, I think, Mashallah, Sister Amal, will you be reading the translation? I'm happy or, to. Yes. Okay, wonderful, wonderful. And then, the, and then something of the commentary. An Adi ibn Hatim, an Nabiya sallallahu alaihi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. It qal. اتقوا النار ولو بشق التمرة اتقوا النار 
ولو بشق تمرة فإن لم تجد فبكلمة طيبة قال صلى الله عليه وآله وصحبه وسلم اتقوا النار ولو بشق تمرة فإن لم تجد فبكلمة طيبة متفق عليه Go ahead, uh, please on the authority of Ali bin Hatim, radiallahu anha, um, may Allah be pleased with him, who said, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, may peace be upon him, said, protect yourselves from the fire, even if with half a day, and if you do not find that, then with a good word. And that's been agreed upon. So this hadith is uh, agreed upon, meaning, what it's uh, it's been related by both Imam Al Bukhari and Imam Muslim in their uh, in their uh, celebrated collections of hadith. Uh, the collection of Imam Al Bukhari and Imam Muslim are regarded by the majority of Muslim scholars, uh, the overwhelming majority of Muslim scholars, to be the most authentic. Uh, collections of those narrations of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, our scholars did something that's unparalleled in religious history. They sifted through all of the sayings, all the narrations, all of the reports that had come to them uh, from Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam through the uh, generation or two to their time. And they developed a science, a methodology for determining how authentic a hadith was. And so uh, Al-Bukhari and Muslim, as, as many, if not all of you know, are uh, among the highest, among the highest caliber uh, of hadith rankings. And when they agree on a hadith, when they agree on a hadith, then it is a sign uh, that we are 99% sure the Prophet Wasallam said that. And why, why do I say 99? Because my teachers in hadith uh, taught us that the only, uh, the only narrations that we are 100% sure of are the Qur'an is the narration or the recitation of the Qur'an, right? So because the hadith was, co was collected by human beings, there's, there's a chance, right? There's always a chance that maybe uh, the hadith, the wording of the hadith was not exactly as was reported. But alhamdulillah, if a, if a, if a narration is agreed upon by Bukhari, Muslim, that's a pretty good sign that the Prophet said. And so Adi ibn Hatim, who so who is he? We don't we don't always do this, but sometimes it's it's really well not sometimes, it's always beneficial to know something about the narrators of these hadith. Adi ibn Hatim uh, is the son of a very famous Arab who um, lived he, he lived before the time of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Hatim At-Ta'i. Hatim At-Ta'i. Hatim At-Ta'i was someone who was known for his incredible generosity. Incredible generosity. And it's no accident that this hadith is about generosity. Adi's father was so generous that the Arabs had a proverb based on him. When someone was exceedingly generous, they would say, huwa akram, huwa min Hatim. He is more generous than Hatim, meaning Hatim Atai. He's more generous than Hatim. She's more generous than Hatim. So Hatim became the symbol of selfless, magnanimity among Arabs who had not yet embraced Islam. 
And <clears throat> a lot has been said about the, the blameworthy traits of the Arabs before the advent of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You know, there was usury, uh, there, was, there was riba, uh, unjust financial gain, there was female infanticide, uh, and there were feuds and, and, and wars and battles. Uh, but we should also know that the Arabs had great virtues. They were, it wasn't black and white, right? They, they, they had virtues and then they also had their vices. And one of their great virtues was their hospitality. It was the virtue that they prized. It was uh, what actually was a part of being an Arab, right? And, and this is very important for us to appreciate. So we should also understand this hadith in that, in that context. So Adi ibn Hatim actually embraced Islam, right? Uh, and the Prophet Sallallahu was very happy that his father, this son of, you know, this legend, right? This legend came into the fold of Islam. And, and then he gives, he shares this hadith with him that affirms a, an attribute that he knew his father embodied, which again, I think is, is just uh, shows the miracle of the Prophet Sallallahu pedagogy, like how he taught people and how he lifted them up and how he affirmed them. May Allah make us such teachers. May Allah Ta'ala help us to affirm the ancestors, the good of the ancestors of our, those who seek knowledge with us, even if those ancestors were not Muslim, even if they were not Muslim. And so this hadith is very short, right? You can memorize it. If you really wanted to, you could probably memorize this hadith in a few hours, maybe in a day, right? maybe in a day. <clears throat> but the commentary, any of you who have the book <laughs> know that the even though this hadith, you can literally fit the hadith on one line, the commentary takes up one, two, three, four, four and a quarter pages. There's so much here. And this is, again, one of the miracles of our beloved Prophet Muhammad, God bless him and grant him peace. Allah, he says, he said in the narration, Utitu Jawami al kalam I was given all encompassing speech. Meaning, he was able to say in a few words what different people from different cultures, you know, we've been talking about different people in different cultures in the last 30 minutes, what pe different people from different backgrounds, social backgrounds, economic backgrounds, uh, intellectual levels, spiritual levels, where people of different levels could all understand according to wherever they are on their journey to God. And he was also, another meaning of him being given all, in, all encompassing speech, jawami al kalim, is that he was able to say in a few words what it would take others, volumes, to communicate. He was, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, a master communicator. Few words, but pregnant, pregnant with meaning, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. May Allah make us among them. May Allah, may Allah make us among such people whose words are, are few, but are meaningful and not people who speak a lot, who talk a lot, but have little, little benefit, bereft of meaning. I mean, and so the first thing that Sheikh uh, Saleh says in this, in his commentary, may Allah Ta'ala be pleased with him and may Allah benefit us through him and his inheritors in this life and the hereafter. He says that this means 
this hadith means that a protective shield between you and the fire on the day of rising, right? On the day, Yom Qiyama is the day of rising. Also, it's the day of standing. Why is Yom Qiyama called the day of standing? Because one of the trials, one of the, the purificatory trials on that day, because all of the trials in this life and in the hereafter are to purify us. They are to purify us or, and or, and or to elevate us. They're for purification or, and or for expiation or, and or for elevation. And or for elevation. So the charity that we give and the good words, the good speech that we, we share are a protective shield for us on the day of rising. The, bro, the beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, God bless him and grant him peace, said, charity extinguishes the anger of the loving Lord. So charity, if there's anything that we've done, if there's anything that we've said, if there's anything that we've thought, that we know is, un, is not beloved or not pleasing to Allah, to God, rush to give charity. This is an ancient, ancient, ancient practice. Allah loves it when we give to others. Charity, sadaqa, zakat is so important that it was made part and parcel of the pillars upon which Islam is built, right? It's that important that it's, it's a duty. We have to give charity as Muslims. And charity should be given with cheer. Charity should be given as our mother, Aisha, as Siddiqa, the truthful, may Allah Ta'ala be pleased with her. When she used to when she used to uh, give charity, she would perfume, she would perfume the the gold or the silver coins that she would give away. And when she was asked, why are you doing this? She said, because the charity reaches the hand of God before it reaches the hand of the destitute, of the poor person. Right. Now she understood that this charity is for my benefit. Right? And I'm offering something to my loving Lord. And so the wrath of God, the anger of God, is extinguished by charity. If you want to rise spiritually, if you want to rise in the ranks of Ridwan, of God's pleasure, if you want to rise in the stations of Mahabba of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the ranks of love of God, exalted and transcendent is He, make a habit every day of giving something in charity. Giving something in charity. Now Imam Ghazali says they, that there are basically three kinds of charity. And he says the best kind of charity, anyone, anyone know what's the best kind of charity? Just so that we can have a more interactive session. <laughs> what's the best kind of charity? Also, so I can take some water. Sound like would that be the charity that's mm -hmm. given, I guess, secretly? That's mashallah. That's that's uh, a wonderful 
wonderful contribution, but it's not what Imam Ghazali said. Okay. But yes, we should give charity. And, and Imam Ali, when Allah, when the when the ayah, when Allah, when God revealed the ayah, <clears throat> excuse me, when God revealed the ayah, praising those who give charity in secret and in public in the night and the day, Imam Ali took four dinars, four gold coins. He gave one in charity in secret. He gave one in charity in public. And he gave one gold coin in charity in the daytime and one in the nighttime because he wanted to, to receive the blessings and the honor of the entire ayah, right? I, like that's someone who's reading the Quran and, and, and asking, how can I creatively embody this ayah? Because some of us might say, oh, okay, there's four ways. I'll, I'll just give it in secret or I'll just give it in public or I'll give it in the night or I'll give it in the day. But he wanted to cover all his bases, didn't he? So Imam Ghazali, let's go back to Imam Ghazali. Imam Ghazali said the best charity, I'm surprised no one said it. I'm surprised because there's some people here that, are, that have been with in my classes for a while now. <laughs> and I usually, I, usually re, I usually repeat myself. But uh, he said that the best charity is the charity of your time. Yes, the charity of your time. You, you remember now? You remember? Yeah, the charity of your time. And after time, he said, the most valuable charity you can give is the charity of, of your knowledge. Time, because of course, once you spend your time, it's, you can't give it back. Like you can give a dollar or a thousand dollars, right? And you can make another thousand dollars and give another thousand dollars away next week or next month or next year. You can give another ten dollars away next week, next month or next year. You can give another dime away, right? Another dinar, another rial, another pound, another dalasi, right? Another sifa. You can. But time, once you give away that hour, once you give away that, that, that minute, you can never get it back. So time first. And we know this from psychology. And, I mean, psychologists have been telling this, this, you know, giving your time and attention to your family, to your friends, like that's what people really need. That's what people are starving for. And then Imam Ghazali says, after time and after knowledge, and he gave away a lot of knowledge right, for free, you know, as an act of charity. He gave away encyclopedias of knowledge, right, that people have been benefiting from for almost a thousand years, you know, now. Imagine what his scale of good deeds look, will look like. Then he said, money. Right? Time, knowledge, then money. Right? And it's very different than what we value as charity in our capitalist, you know, communist world, socialist world. May Allah save us. <laughs> May Allah help us. To, to realize that Islam, the economic system and the business principles that are within Islam. Uh, and, you know, Sidi Baraka Blue mentioned Ramiz, Sidi Ustad Ramiz Kent earlier. Uh, he, Ustad Ramiz Kent and Dr. Adi Setia are teaching a class <clears throat> on stewardship and sustainability, which is a summary an abridged version of their Islamic gift economy and a program for ethical, appropriate, and regenerative livelihood, right? which is an amazing course that I'm actually taking myself, the long version that is. Uh, and, and what you, and, and, and it's, it, isn't it telling that the system, our economic system is framed as a gift economy. 
a gift economy where charity is facilitated for people, where people receive so much because of integrity and justice in the commercial sector that they want to give. They're compelled to give with Ihsan, exactly, uh, Sister Sara. Right, this is an extension of Ihsan. And so Sheikh Saleh goes on to say, so again, if you've sinned, if you've done wrong, if you've violated Allah's, the rights of God, or the rights of your fellow human beings, or the rights of animals, or the rights of plants, or the rights of the planet, and you know, who of us, who among us, either directly or indirectly, is not guilty of the last three? Right? Like, you may not have violated the rights of Allah, right? You may be a Muslim who does, who has done all their prayers on time from the beginning of puberty, right? From the onset of puberty, if not earlier. You may be a Muslim who's always fasted Ramadan. You may be a Muslim who's never committed any uh, uh, violation of God's rule, rulings and what is between you and Allah, between you and God. But the way we're living, the way we are currently living as a species, as a species, directly or indirectly, causes harm. Causes harm to the planet, to the animals, to plants, to ecosystems, to the atmosphere, and to our fellow human beings, right? And so we should assume, and I'm not saying that to make anyone feel guilty or feel bad about themselves, but just to be aware, I mean, some of this is outside of our control. I mean, there, there are people who do their best to make sure that the the supply chain and the distribution chain of goods and services that comes to them is, is free and fair, is free of oppression and injustice and exploitation. But there's some things that you know, we don't know about. And we have you know, prayers from the Prophet Oh Allah, you know, forgive me. Oh Allah, forgive me for the sins I know of and the ones I don't know of. So we should be giving charity all the time. We should be giving charity all the time, especially in our day and age. The human being, we should not belittle any act of charity because Allah, because God accepts all of it, great or small. There is no amount of charity that is too small. Allah says, even in Surah Al-Zalzala, whoever does, فَمَنْ يَعْمَلْ مِثْقَالَ ذَرَّةٍ خَيْرًا يَرَى Whoever does a speck, a dharra is a speck. Right? A dharra, they translate it as Adam, right? But it's, it's a little speck. Whoever does a speck of goodness, They'll see it. And whoever does a speck of evil will see it. May Allah protect us from the evil we do and the evil of others. And may Allah Ta'ala envelop us in the good that we do. May Allah increase the good that we do. And May Allah Ta'ala increase the good that people do towards us. Ameen, ameen, ameen. And so he goes on to say that in the Quran, Allah reveals that he not only accepts good deeds, he multiplies good deeds. In Surah An-Nisa, in the 40th ayah, which is a very important surah, uh, because it's all about taking care of 
those that are considered weak, those that are vulnerable in society. That's one of the wisdoms that it was titled Surat al-Nisa, the chapter of the women. It's not only about women, it's about orphans, it's about women, it's about, you know, captives and, and, and so on and so forth, widows. And, and in this surah, in ayah 40, Allah says, if it is a good deed, he multiplies it. If it is a good deed, he multiplies that good deed. And the Prophet ﷺ said about this, that it means that Allah makes it grow with him. Just like a farmer raises a foal, right? A foal, you know, the horse has a, 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 a foal and takes care of it till it reaches maturity. Allah takes care of your charity. He's saying, the Prophet Sallallahu said, whoever gives in charity from honest earnings, and that's another, that's another thing we have to be aware of. Whoever gives in charity from honest earnings. So being careful how we earn our livelihood. All right. Are we earning our livelihood from uh, means that are within the Quran and within the Sunnah? Are we earning our livelihoods from halal means? And I'm not just talking about, you know, uh, not robbing a bank. For example, if you earn your money uh, from uh, riba, that's a problem, right? You need to transition out of that. If you earn your money from selling alcohol or any other haram substances or impure substances, that's a problem. You need to transition out of that. If you earn your money from doing research uh, on you know, nuclear physics, uh, in, in the area of nuclear physics to develop better ways of killing human beings, either with you know, chemical or biological uh, or nuclear means, that's a problem. I remember when I was in college, I met a brother, nice brother, who was in the MSA. He was in the Muslim Student Association. And, and you know, he asked me what I was majoring in, and I said Arabic, right? And of course, whenever I said Arabic, people were like, what? what are you going to do with that? How are you going to make money? <laughs> right? How are you going to make money with Arabic? Right? You know, that wasn't my concern. I had a particular f mission. Right? Of course, if I was going to do it all over again, I would have double majored in Arabic and something else that was of interest to me. But anyway, so I asked him, well, what are you majoring in? And he said, oh, I'm majoring in, I think he said something like physics or, or nuclear engineering, something like that. He said, yeah, I'm going to go work for Lockheed. <laughs> and I said, Lockheed, don't they make like, weapons of mass destruction? He's like, yes, but, you know, that's not my, that's not my business. That's not, you know, that's between, you know, I'm going there, I'm doing my research, and I go home. That's my plan, right? No, 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 no. As a, that we, we have to... When we say Islam is a way of life, it means that I am living in a way that's conscious of God and conscious of the well-being of my fellow creatures, whether I'm in the mosque or whether I'm at work, whether I'm at school, or whether I'm in my bedroom. We shouldn't have this, this cognitive dissonance, this, this, this disconnect between how we show up. You know, I, I, I'm in the mosque and I'm you know, praying and I'm, you know, Allahu Akbar and I have my kufi or my khimar, my hijab on and I'm saying assalamu alaikum at the end of my prayer, but I'm going to work. I'm saying peace be upon you at the end of my prayer. But when I go to work, I'm not spreading peace. I'm spreading war. And what kind of charity is that? I'm facilitating destruction of Allah's creatures. 
And is that okay? Just because they give, you know, a thousand dollars or ten thousand dollars to the masjid or to the Islamic school? Is that okay? I mean, I, I, I can tell you so many stories of whole communities. I'm not gonna name any cities, right? I won't name any cities, but whole communities that have been built from money made from selling alcohol to black people and brown people, Muslims who own Muslims. I'm not talking about, you know, it's, you know, I'm talking about Muslims who owned gas stations, convenience stores, taking their money and giving it to the board members of whatever masjid, you know, the building, and the board members know, know where the, the source of this money and use it to build their mosque and fund their programs. And I know imams who've been fired, fired for calling, you know, calling people to account for this, right? So this is really important. The Prophet is telling us, whoever gives in charity from honest earnings, and God accepts only the good, Allah is tayyib, inna Allah tayyib wa la yaqbalu illa tayyibah. The Prophet Sallallahu said in another hadith, Allah is good, Allah is pure, and Allah only accepts what is good and pure. God will accept it in his right hand, meaning Allah, God will accept it in his right hand, and the scholars say that this means Allah will accept it with honor, in his pleasure, and will then increase it in size for the giver. Just as one of you Rees, rears his foal, <clears throat> rears his foal until it is the size of a mountain. So imagine a small horse, right, that becomes, you know, something that's the size of a small horse that becomes the size of Mount Everest, right? That's what happens with a pure intention. Mashallah. It's also been narrated <clears throat> that the mother of the believers, Our Lady Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her, asked, was asked to give something in charity. So she gave this beggar, she gave him one grape, one grape, right? Can you imagine a beggar comes to you and you give them one grape, not a bunch of grapes, just one, one little grape, right? And he said, what is this, O oh mother? I love this hadith because it, it, again, it shows you how the, the early Muslims used to refer to the wives of the Prophet Sallallahu And that's why usually I try to do my best when I speak about the wives of the Prophet Sallallahu I, I try to remind myself in those listening to refer to them as mother. They are our mothers. They are our spiritual mothers. So he says, what is this, oh mother? Like, you're giving me a grape? Yeah, what am I supposed to do with this? Right? She said to him, look at what she said to him. Look at how many atoms are in it. Look at how many dharat, look at how many atoms are in it. Like, how many atoms are in a grape? Billions, right? Hey, she's looking at reality with a different lens. This is the tarbiya. This is the pedagogy of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. This is what happens when you allow the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam into your heart, brothers and sisters. When you allow him to teach you, when you allow him to purify you, when you allow him to recite upon you. When you allow him to purify you, rather, when you allow him to recite upon you, when you allow him to purify you, when you allow him to teach you. And then she said, she recites the ayah, then she recited the ayah, Right. This, again, this shows you her connection with the Qur'an, 
right? This, he who does an Adam's weight of good will see it. And he and said to him, this grape that I gave you was from a bunch of grapes that I had saved for the fast breaking meal of the Prophet for the iftar of the Prophet right? Like you're looking at this little, this grape as if it's something insignificant. If you knew what I knew about this grape, you'd be happy if I gave you the skin of the grape. I used to give, this grape is from a bunch of grapes that Rasulullah used to break his fast with. So, you know, maybe, Allahu Alam, you know, maybe these were, you know, if it was not long after the Prophet Sallallahu passed, maybe these were raisins, maybe they were dried grapes, for example, right? Because they didn't have refrigeration back then. And then the man became happy, you know? <laughs> he became happy when he knew that, and then he left. Because, you know, he, what, what, what made him happy? Because of the connection of the grapes with the Prophet Sallallahu so, so she gave him two, you know, two points of connection. The Qur'an and the Prophet Sallallahu Like, don't belittle this. Because Allah says, even an atom, even an atom of good will be manifest, will be seen. And don't belittle this, because this grape is from grapes that I used to give to the Prophet Sallallahu to break his fast. Allahu Akbar. So we should go through life like this. We should not belittle anything connected with the Prophet Sallallahu Right? We should never belittle any act of charity. If you go to that fundraiser and people are giving, you know, you're hearing people say, oh, who can give 10,000? Who can give 5,000? Who can give, you know, a thousand dollars and and you're like well i i should even I, why am i even going to the fundraiser why am i even here i could give twenty dollars and that that is a struggle don't don't feel like your charity is less than theirs there's a story in the bible that's narrated in the gospels Right. Those of you who, like me, grew up in the church know this story. There was a, you know, there was a time when Prophet Jesus, السلام, peace be upon him, was preaching. And then after he was preaching, his disciples were collecting charity. And then this elderly woman walks by and she just gives like a shekel, you know, a shekel. And Allah gave him an unveiling, gave Prophet Jesus, the Messiah, the son of Mary, peace and blessings be upon him, an unveiling, so that he saw this woman's state. And he said, this woman has given more than anyone else here. <laughs> and, the, and the disciples are puzzled. Like they're seeing other people give gold and you know, lots of money. And, and this woman just gives a shekel or so. And she gave more than everyone here. So why was that? Because if we're at a fundraiser, for example, we're at our mosque, a, a mosque fundraiser, and the millionaire gives $10,000, right? What does that do to his bottom line? What does that do to his bank account? It doesn't really put a dent in it, does it? But if someone who's struggling, someone who's you know middle class or working class, or you know someone who's destitute or homeless, only has a hundred dollars to their name, and they come to the fundraiser and they give fifty dollars, or they give ten dollars, or they give a hundred dollars, they've given everything they have, like their faith, their faith is greater than the person who gave $10,000 and who's a millionaire. as Burhan, the Prophet said, charity is a proof 
A proof of what? Your faith. Because when you give charity, you're saying, I have more confidence in what is in Allah's hand than what's in my hand. And he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, مَا نَقَصَ مَالٍ مِنْ Chari That wealth was never ever decreased by giving charity. Actually, charity only increases your wealth. Like if you give charity from honest earnings, as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said, with a cheerful and sincere heart, seeking Allah, not seeking to be, you know, uh, congratulated or accolades or praised <clears throat> or get any credit if you give charity just for Allah, right? Then that is a proof of your faith. That's a proof of your faith. MashaAllah. Then uh, he mentions, <clears throat> he mentions another. It's amazing that all of these hadith, so many hadith about charity come from our mother Aisha. And she practiced what she preached. There's a story about how a, a caravan of, of goods came into, uh, of, you know, of, of wealth came into Medina for Aisha, our mother Aisha. And by Asr, it was all, she distributed everything. It was all gone to the poor. She gave it all away, right? She gave it all away. <laughs> like, you know, masjid zakat committees would have a real problem with her, right? <laughs> like you're giving it all away in one day. Right? But they just, they had a different understanding. And it was a different world, right? It was a different world. You know, there, there's certain, you know, I will admit there's certain complexities socio-economic complexities that we have now, but we do need a, a, a more uh, equitable redistribution of wealth in, within our Muslim communities, right? So we're going to wrap up so we can um, allow for Q&A. Uh, now, this is an intensive course. We only have three sessions, and I thank Allah, and you know, I don't have a backup generator, <laughs> so I thank Allah that you know, the electricity is holding up. Uh, I don't have a backup generator here. Uh, we've been trying to get one, but it just hasn't happened yet. And it's too late for me to be at uh, a restaurant or someplace using theirs. So <clears throat> hopefully we will have these over the next uh, three weeks, this week and then two more weeks, inshallah. <clears throat> and, um, I do want to leave time because I'm only I'm going to cover a new hadith, a new hadith each week. We're not going to do like two or three weeks like we've done in the past <clears throat> because this is a special summer session, you know. And I and I really thank you all uh, for your your presence, and I don't take it for granted your time and your attention because that is the greatest charity, right? You know, that's charity that you're giving me. Right? That's charity that you're giving to me. Alhamdulillah. May Allah accept. So we'll just read this hadith, <coughs> and then we'll, we'll talk about a kalima tayyiba uh, briefly, <coughs> and then we will uh, open up for a Q&A, inshallah. People used to see our mother Aisha, Allah be pleased with her, applying the musk of the Prophet Sallallahu to any coin, any coin that she wanted to give in charity. Right. So the Prophet Sallallahu would use musk. Right. Musk is from the glands of the, of the deer. Right? It's, a, it's, a, it's a gland that has a beautiful fragrance. <clears throat> and she would take the musk of the Prophet Sallallahu the perfume that he used to use, and she would put that perfume on the charity, on the coin that she would give. And when, before handing it to the poor person, when she was asked about that, she replied, I heard the Prophet ﷺ say, charity falls into the hand of God before it falls into the hand of the asker. Right. Again, it's a different understanding of reality. Like, you know, Allah's, you know, not literally 
taking the koi. Right? But what is reaching Allah? It's the intention. It's the sincerity. Right? But, you know, again, she's beautifying her charity. This is what you know, Sara was talking about earlier. This is from Ihsan. Beautifying the charity. So what is it like to receive a, a regular coin versus one that's been perfumed? Versus one that's perfumed with the scent that a person, this smells like the Prophet <laughs> What is it to like to receive charity that smells like Rasulullah Like this is what Aisha understood. So, you know, it, in business, you know, you, 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 you learn about how, you know, Starbucks came to be, right? And McDonald's and these big, you know, international chains. And, 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 and one of their marketing strategies was to make coming into their franchises an experience. You know, you hear things, you smell things, you feel a certain way, right? Our mother Aisha Radulana is applying that to charity. So receiving charity from Aisha Radulana was an experience. She wasn't just giving you charity, she was also connecting you with the Prophet. And that is what life is all about connecting with the Quran, connecting with Allah, connecting with the Prophet Muhammad. In a deep, deep, deep way. That is what gives life meaning. Without those, life does not have any, any meaning. Life does not have any meaningfulness. It doesn't. Not in any everlasting, long-term way. No. Mm -mm. Life does not have meaning unless you connect, you're, you have a deep, you cultivate a deep connection with God and with God's prophets and his messengers. Peace and blessings be upon them. That is what makes the mundane meaningful. That is what makes the mundane meaningful. That is what makes the mundane meaningful. So a good word, and I'll, I'll sum, I'll, I, I, we don't have time to read through the commentary in, in, in any detail, but good speech is also a way of protecting yourself from the hellfire. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu said, فَمَنْ كَانَ يُؤْمِنُ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ فَلْيَقُلْ خَيْرًا Whoever believes in God and the hereafter, let them speak good. Let them speak goodly. Let them speak well or be silent. Right? Like, you know, <laughs> our grandmothers and, and, and used to say, if you can't say nothing good, don't say nothing. If you can't say nothing good, don't say nothing. That's a prophetic teaching. You know, and it's important for us to look back in our families, look back in our history, and find prophetic teaching and prophetic wisdom among our, 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 our parents and, 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 our, and our grandparents and our great-grandparents. You'll find a lot there. Right? Don't think that becoming Muslim means you have to turn your back wholesale against your heritage and your upbringing. Right? Find the light in your upbringing. Find the guidance in your upbringing. And so what does good speech mean? So good speech means a kind word. It means an uplifting word. Using your words uh, as a means to bring goodness into the world, into people's lives. A good speech means the Qur'an. The Qur'an is the best of speech. Why is the Qur'an the best of speech? 
because it is the word of God. It is the word of God. And so there's no better speech than God's word. Right? There's a great woman, mashallah, her name is Fidba. Anyone heard of Fidba? Uh, yes, no? Fidba? <laughs> she was a Nubian woman. I've spoken about her in some of my courses on black lives around the messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And one of her miracles was that she spoke for 20 years only using the Quran in her speech. She spoke for 20 years and whenever she responded verbally to a question or a circumstance or a statement, she would only recite the appropriate ayah of the Quran. <laughs> right? It's amazing, right? So good speech is the Quran, good speech is a kind word, Good speech is telling the truth. Good speech is not backbiting and not slandering. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, Al-Muslim, man salim nas min lisanihi wa yadihi, that the Muslim is the person from whom the people are safe from their tongue and their, ha and their hands. And he said, the Muslim is the one from whom other Muslims, from whom other Muslims are safe from their tongue and their hands. So we should keep people safe from our tongues, but not using our tongues to lie, not using our tongues to spread rumors, to, to gossip, you know, qila wa qal and and all of these things, you know, there's a saying, loose lips sink ships. You ever heard that one, right? Loose lips sink ships, yeah, yeah. Loose lips, tongues can destroy families and destroy marriages and destroy communities, destroy institutions. And, and the Prophet Wasallam, he was the most beautiful in speech. So he says, and I'll, 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 I'll mention this in conclusion. He said, just as the tongue brings, a, that the, he says that Shihabuddin al Khafaji said, if speech was of silver, then silence is of gold. So while good speech is praiseworthy, it's even better to be silent. Right? Nine tenths of wisdom is in silence, the great sages said. So, disciplining ourselves to only speak when it is true, when it is kind, and when there's benefit. Alhamdulillah. So, may Allah Ta'ala protect us from the fire. May Allah Ta'ala protect us uh, from the fire through giving charity and through good speech. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, if you guarantee two things for me, hadith, that's narrated in Al-Muwatta, Mamalik, if you guarantee two things for me, I will guarantee the garden, I will guarantee paradise for you. Like people ask me all the time, how do I get to paradise? Like, you know, what, what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam already told us, two things, if you guarantee for him, he guarantees paradise for us. He says, guard what is between your two jaws, meaning your tongue. Guard your tongue. <clears throat> and the scholars say that your tongue has been put between two uh, uh, barriers, right? Two bars. You have the, the barrier of the teeth and the barrier of the lips. Like it's imprisoned. Your tongue has been imprisoned by two barriers. So only let it out with good behavior. <laughs> like you can only come out of prison, you know, with good behaviors. So the Prophet said, I'm saying, guarantee for me what's between your two jaws 
meaning your speech, and what's between your two thighs, meaning your private parts. Guard, safeguard your private parts from fornication, you know, having uh, uh, physical intimacy outside of marriage, from adultery, having physical inti intimacy with someone who's not your spouse, from masturbation, from pornography, and all of the, you know, guard your private parts from using your private parts in any way that's not beloved to Allah Ta'ala and it's not a constructive force for the building of the society. So may Allah Ta'ala give us success. May Allah Ta'ala help us to safeguard our tongues and be people who give charity uh, all the days of our lives, who give ongoing charity. Sadaqatun jariyah, ongoing charity. Alhamdulillah. So we'll pass it back uh, to our dear sister Amma and for any questions or comments. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you so much. That was wonderful. And also the biggest thank you is to you, Ya Sheikh, um, for your time tonight. <laughs> time difference and everything. Um, I only see one question. Please go ahead and put any questions you may have. Um, and I think we have a a hand risen, um, but uh, there's a question from Sarah and she's saying, how can we make our time sharing a charity and how do I know that? Sarah, you can unmute if you'd like, if you'd like to clarify your question as well. Yeah, so Bismillah, Alhamdulillah, uh, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Muhammad wa Ali wa Sahbi wa man wa la. And what I understand from the question is, uh, you know, how do we give our time in charity? And, and it's, it's as simple as, you know, uh, when your family or your friends are in need of you to listen, you know, to listen to a story or to listen to their, their accomplishments, or to listen to their pain. You're there. You're there, right? Uh, it means if you, you know, need to invest your time to teach someone, you make time, you take the time, right? And, uh, and the test is, uh, you know, Many of us have opportunities every day, every week, when these unexpected uh, demands on our time from people around us, people we say we love, people we say we care about, people we say, you know, uh, that we're brothers and sisters of, right? And a lot of times because of our very frenetic, very busy lives, we don't make the time, you know? So it's, 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 it's giving people of your time. It's spending quality time and quantities of time, right? With your family, right? That is charity as well, you know? So not being stingy with your time, and I know, you know, for some people, like I know uh, a friend of mine, he's very productive. Um, he has, you know, he started his own businesses when he was in high school, right? He's like very, like, you know, very, very diligent, very successful. You know, he graduated from Yale University, but he doesn't need, he doesn't give or at least he did it. I don't. Hopefully he's changed. But the last time I was, you know, with him and his family, you know, um, you know, his family wanted him to spend more time with them. But he said to them, you know, I have to look at my schedule, you know, and see if I have time. And and so, you know, making time for meaningful connection with others is is a part of charity we shouldn't just think 
that giving money is charity. We shouldn't just think donating dollars or pounds uh, or, you know, genie or delicy is charity. Right? Charity is also giving people your time, whether it's them asking for advice or any of the other examples that I give. Hopefully that helps. Yeah, uh, Sunna, I see your hand. You have your hand up if you'd like to ask uh, your question. I love that name, by the way, Sunna Muhammad. It's good to have you back at Imam Nats. Um, I feel the sense of like returning home to the class. That feels really good. Alhamdulillah, thank you so much for your time and for the knowledge that you share with us. Um, yeah, this topic has brought up a few questions for me, actually. Um, one, I noticed myself like going through this phase of like giving, but feeling a sense of like scarcity or bitterness when I give. And I, I try to give anyways, because I feel like, okay, no, we're, you know, I'm trying to do this for the right intentions. And uh, even if I feel the scarcity, there's other times when I feel this abundance and it feels like there's it's unlimited like Allah always beautiful alhamdulillah um but should I give like when I feel that sense of like um I don't know if I can or or my time or or my energy or or my resources should I be giving like pushing it a little bit more to give more or should I also try to balance out how much I'm get, putting forward and how much I should also be putting into myself so that I could be able to give more and give in quality of giving, not just, um, I hope I could get, get to the point where I'm giving an ahsan and perfuming my giving to that extent. Um, but also another question was, also sometimes I give and I notice that I know that Allah is going to, there's benefit from me giving. And is that intention okay? Like if I'm giving, and I know that it's going to benefit me also to give. Allah is going to benefit me. Like, is that intention, is that considered okay? And if I'm also, you mentioned something about giving and Allah's anger, that it removes anger of Allah. And is that a giving out of fear of Allah? Or is that a giving out of, um, for Allah? Like, is that the highest intention of just giving for the sake of Allah? Or is that... Um, yeah, I think that, that was, I think that's enough. Zakallah khair, assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum sunnah. Thank you for those questions. May Allah bless you and all of those who are with us today. My advice, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, wa sallam ala kareem wa sallam ala sallam. My advice is to give uh, according to uh, what you can give with joy and with cheer and do that and, and keep doing that until Allah Ta'ala inspires you to give more. You know? uh, the fact that you're giving is a great, great, great blessing of Allah upon you. Right? That is a great thing. and sincerity is a lifelong journey journey ikhlas seeking ikhlas in any act of worship is a lifelong journey it's a lifelong journey uh, and so not feeling like we're in our best state you know while we're giving charity or, or giving time or giving knowledge should not be a barrier to us giving Right? Those are, so, so giving is one thing, and then our state while we're giving is something we should continually work on, ask Allah to uh, give us a heart that is absolutely confident in Him and open to His mercy. Because Allah, you know, Allah gives to us in so many ways you know, that we... We, we don't even recognize, and, and many of us won't even recognize until we're dead, you know, or until the day of judgment, or until we're in paradise, inshallah. Um, so my advice to you is give 
according to what your resources and what your capacity makes it easy for you to give. Okay? The Prophet Muhammad وسلم, he had companions who gave at different levels. Some companions, like Abu Bakr Siddiq, gave away everything or almost everything. Some like Umar radiallahu anhu, Al Farooq, you know, radiallahu anhu ma gave away half of his wealth on one occasion. Other companions, the Prophet وسلم, actually stopped them from giving away more than a third of their wealth. Like they wanted to give more, but he told them no, no. <laughs> so you know, each of us is on a journey and, and each of us has different capacities. Each of us has different levels of faith and faith itself, any level of faith is something that is absolutely awesome, awesome. Like we use that word awesome so that we just throw it around, right? You know, I just had some nacho cheese chips, awesome, right? Like faith is awesome. Awesome, right? So don't stop giving, but give from a place that's comfortable for you and, 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 and ask Allah to deepen your experience, inshallah. Um, and the, the second question, uh, I'm forgetting what the second question was. I'm sorry, it's, it's a little late. Awa, could you help me? What was the second question? Uh, Sunnah's so second part, I don't actually. Sunnah, so was there a second so the, part to Yes, uh, what was the second? Uh... Yeah, the second question was, if I'm giving and I know that it's going to benefit me, like, is okay, that, yes, yes, that like, that. selfish? Or got like, it, got it. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yes. So, uh, benefiting yourself is a good thing. Benefiting yourself is a good thing. Benefiting others and benefiting yourself is a good thing. What you want is to know that you know, giving charity, giving of yourself, it's something that you should know that it's pleasing to Allah, that it's benefiting others, and that it's benefiting yourself. So you should reflect on that and, and be cognizant that there's multiple, uh, you have multiple intentions, multiple motives here. If you're only, and I, I, I doubt this is the case, but if a person's only motivation for giving charity is, you know, for themselves to benefit, then that's someone who needs to, you know, work, you know, needs to do more work on their, you know, cultivating a sound, healthy intention. I wouldn't tell the person to stop giving, no, never, no, still give, right? Because you're still benefiting others. And, you know, you never know when Allah Ta'ala will turn your heart so that the giving is purely for Him. And so there's stages, you know, there's stages. Don't be hard on yourself. We are all growing. We are all learning. We all make mistakes. Uh, we all make mistakes. The Prophet Sallallahu said this, all of the children of Adam make mistakes. And the best of those who make mistakes are those who repent. So please keep giving, and it's good that you're reflecting and thinking about these. It shows a lot of introspection on your part, uh, and that's a very good sign. Uh, but alhamdulillah, you know, don't, don't look at it as selfish. Uh, I, I would just look at it as um, being uh, beneficial to yourself. But of course, you're not the only one benefiting, and, and ultimately, we ask Allah Ta'ala to make your charity and, and all of our charity uh, for His for His pleasure. Because Allah loves, you know, Allah Allah has, you know, Allah manages and maintains and provides for the whole universe. For the whole universe. And so He loves it when we reflect that 
in our own limited capacity as human beings. So Allah loves it when we take care of others. And so those of you that are mothers, you have a great, great, great station with Allah. Uh, if you are in motherhood mindfully, if you're in grandmotherhood mindfully, like you are mindful that I'm a mother and I'm giving my, my knowledge, my body, my time, my money, you know, you know, my 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 mental, you know, my emotional capacity, my spirit. You're giving everything, and so, especially those of you that are mothers and grandmothers, either of your own biological children or other people's children, or mothers in the community, or in the mosque. You're giving so much, and and, it's, and you should intend everything you give as charity. No one's paying you, right? Anyone paying you? Huh? Anyone paying you for being a mother? And that's 24 seven. That's 24 seven. So, so give of yourself to your babies and your, your children, your adult children, give as an act of, of charity. And, and, and that, those mundane acts from changing the diapers to doing the dishes, and, you know, putting a Band-Aid on a, on a boo-boo, right? All of those become acts of worship. Yeah. And it means for you attaining great, great ranks with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I think uh, I just see another question here. Uh, may I ask a clarification about transitioning from riba-based livelihood, please? In currently high inflation period where food and living cost has been rising significantly, would it, would it be riba occupations such as businesses involved in oppressive financial transactions for material monetary gain? For example, businesses such as payday loan advance or mortgage brokers. So I, I can't answer uh, your question specifically without knowing exactly what the business is and what it entails, but, but generally. So I'm not giving you a fatwa. I'm not giving you a legal verdict, but generally, like payday loan advances. And, yeah, that's, that's riba, <laughs> you know, because there's interest on the loans. And, and you know, I, I don't know what it's going to take. My brothers and sisters, I don't know what it's going to take for us to realize that we have to build our own internal viable economies. We have to. And myself and a few other imams, a few other scholars have been saying this for almost 10 years or more now. There's some who've been saying it for like 30, 40 years, right? But that, that was another generation. I'm talking about my generation, right? We've been saying this for 10, 15 years, and, and people are just, you know, the people think that people have so much faith in the system instead of working together, because you cannot do this alone. You cannot go so low on this instead of us working together on creative and viable alternatives to the dominant social, socioeconomic order. That people can choose. We're not talking about, you know, imposing anything on anybody. Like the Amish, like just like look up the Amish, look up the Mennonites. See if they're worried about gas. Right. Anyone know about the Amish? You, at, you go ask the Amish if they're worried about the price of gas. And the difference between us and the Amish is the Amish have stayed true to their spiritual, moral, ethical framework. And we have not as Muslims. We have not, you know, we are going, we're on the Titanic and we're along for the ride, right? 
we're along for the ride, and as long as we, we're on the Titanic and we're okay, as long as we get our halal buffet, we can eat halal food, and as long as we can pray five times a day, we're fine. As long as they let us pray five times a day on the Titanic, as long as we can eat halal food, we go to the buffet, is that halal meat? Alhamdulillah, we eat our halal meat. <laughs> as long as we can fast Ramadan on the Titanic, we are happy. Whereas the Amish and the Mennonites were like, no, uh-uh, we're not getting on that boat. We are not getting on that boat. And because of that, they are not suffering the way so many other Americans and people around the world are suffering right now. Now, I'm going to say this again, and I wasn't asked to say this, but if you have not, if you are not taking the stewardship and sustainability class that Dr. Adi Setia and Sidi Ramiz Kent are offering through Wasat, please take it and learn how we can transition from Reba businesses and Reba livelihoods and, and just livelihoods that harm Allah's creatures uh, and build economies like the economies of our ancestors, you know, that were resilient, that were, that were profitable, uh, and that did minimal harm, that did minimal harm to the world and to others. You know, and I'm not saying our ancestors were, were all angels. No, there, there was slavery and there was, you know, there was, uh, there was, there were mistakes that were made. And, and, but, but I'm just, you know, compared to what we have now, we, we have a lot to learn. So my advice is, you know, take the IGE Pearl, uh, you know, go to IGEPearl.org. Look up uh, stewardship and sustainability on Wasat's uh, uh, website and, and take the course so we can learn about alternatives. So I would just say, Ahmed, um, in general, yes, those don't sound like the kind of businesses you want to be involved in. And, you know, ask Allah to give you alternative livelihood uh, that's halal and tayyib. Ask Allah to help you if you need to to skill up to get the skills to get the connections that are necessary to uh, transition to alternative income streams inshallah ta'ala you know and, and this it's really important for our spiritual growth and in fact our ancestors muslim scholars of the past they would always teach that your livelihood how you earned your livelihood how you spent your money your local economy is tied to your spiritual growth. And for some reason now, we, we think there's no connection. You know, we think there's no connection. So, you know, may Allah help us. Alhamdulillah. May Allah give us success. I think that's it, uh, Sister Amma. Yes, and uh, just to do a time check, thank you for staying over time. Alhamdulillah.